great appropriate song for that time. Thank you guys. So, Revelation chapter 2. You thought you were going to get a four minute sermon. I'm just starting. All right, let's go. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2. You knew that wasn't going to happen. That wasn't the end. Let's read. Let's read from God's Word. Revelation 2, starting in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, The first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life, says, I know your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have tribulation over ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor will never be harmed by the second death. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this, this precious message to the church at Smyrna and that is relevant for churches all throughout um, these ages and even to us here in Sheffield, Iowa. Father, would you, through the power of your Holy Spirit that's able to, to speak to each one of us um, as we need in our hearts, would you speak to us, Father? Encourage us, strengthen us to persevere. Thank you for the victory that is found in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. He is the Lord, the one and only King of kings and Lord of lords. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, Smyrna was a town of about 100,000 people. It was in what's modern day, it's in Turkey, which is what's Turkey today. I think the town is still active in about 200,000. It's called um, Izmir, maybe in Turkey, I don't know. But the name Smyrna means bitter. And it relates to the word myrrh, which was used, a spice used to prepare people for burial, the body for burial. And so um, it was a great, though, proud, rich, very relevant city. But when this message is written to it in Revelation chapter 2, John starts right off and Jesus tells us to focus on Him. This has, been my, this has been my focus all along, right? That when we go through Revelation, when we look at Revelation and look at the text and read about what's going on, we keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Keep our eyes on Jesus. And that's what it tells us to do right off the bat. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, the first and the last the one who was dead and came to life. Focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's just like back in verse 17 of chapter 1 when John saw Jesus and he fell like a dead man. The Bible says that he, Jesus laid his right hand on John and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever and hold the keys to death and Hades. And so we keep our eyes on Jesus and start off, and that'll be a good place for us to do as, as we go through this quick little, these few, few verses right here this morning. So I want to read verse 9 again, because this is when it uh, really gets into the church and focuses on them. Verse 9 says, and now it's, he's going to say something twice. He's going to say, I know twice. So listen for it. I know your tribulation and poverty yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Just as we found out in the, church, the letter to the church at Ephesus, Jesus starts off and says, I know, which is, again, that's good news and bad news, but here it's good news. There's no words of condemnation for this church at Smyrna. It's all positive. It's all, and he's saying, I know what's going on. I know you're I know you're having tribulations. I know you're in poverty. I know people are slandering you. I know what's going on. And Jesus knows you, and Jesus knows me, and Jesus knows this church, and he knows what's going on. Far more than we do. He knows exactly what's going on. And I don't know if that's good or bad in your life, but he knows. He knows. If you're, He knows when you say a, quick prayer for someone, they'll maybe never find out. Maybe one of you comes to mind, and you do all through the week, I promise you, and I say a quick prayer to you. You know what? 
Jesus knows, doesn't he? He knows it and he hears it and he intervenes. And maybe you do something for somebody. They don't even realize it. Jesus knows. Now, on the, conversely, when we do something that we'd rather not people find out, he knows that as well. But it's encouraging that he knows us completely and there's no words of condemnation for this church. Men were causing them tribulation. Men were causing them to be poor. Men were causing them the slandering against them and stuff. But God says, you know, I know you're not, I know you're not getting affirmation from other people, but I know. And I'm pleased with what's going on. I'm bringing you praise. So let me explain why they were so poor, because I thought you just told me that this is a, huge, a rich city and a powerful and a cultural relevant city. Why were they being persecuted and why were they poor? Well, it goes back to, if you'll picture guild, they had guilds. If you picture kind of a, now I don't mean this in a negative connotation, but if you think about um, a union today, they had what was called guilds. And so if you were a merchant in that day, you would belong to a merchant's guild. And if you were a potter, you would join a potter's guild. Or if you were a baker, you would join a... Very good. Thank you, Diane. One... So one person's tracking with me. So you would join a guild. The problem with that is it was heavily supported by the Roman Empire. And part of the, part of the point of being a part of that group was that you gave reverence and revered um, the Roman Empire, and the Caesars. So part of their meetings would be that they would put a little incense on the fire and they would say, Caesar is Lord. And so that was a problem for Christians. When we are tempted today to compromise and to back down and say, well, yeah, I'm going to work at this place. I know they're not, you know, I know they're not doing everything right, but, you know, I've got I to provide for my family and I'm just going to compromise here a little bit. No, they would not compromise. I'll just tell you a quick story. It just, just came to my mind. I think I've told you before, but Joey and I were young, and um, so it was many years ago. Uh, no kids yet, and I took, I was a meat cutter, and I got this great opportunity to work for a place up by Spencer, and um, so I worked there about a week, and I realized that the meat manager that I was working under was doing some things that were unethical, and so I approached him about that, it happened that some friends of ours that lived up in Spencer at the time, um, she was shopping and she heard the guy screaming at me, by the way. But, so you can tell how that went. But I said, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think this is right. You shouldn't be doing this. And uh, he pretty much told me, you know, I'm making a lot more than you and who are you to tell me what to do? And I said, well, I'm not. I'm just asking you to change. And he wouldn't. So after I moved her up there, away from our families, out in the middle of nowhere, literally, um, I resigned. So a couple days later, I found myself working in a chicken, a chicken farm. Like, you know, yeah, that was great. But you know what? But I, I made a stand, and, I, and God honored that in many different ways. And here's what I want to encourage you. To not compromise, not give in. It cost these people at Smyrna everything. If, if they had a business and they weren't part of a guild, they lost everything. Nobody would do business with them, um, and they lost everything. And they were being persecuted if they were found out that they were, that they were serving Jesus and worshiping Jesus and that Jesus was Lord in their mind. They would lose everything. Some of them would be thrown into slavery. Some of them would be killed, and they would lose everything. And people would, people would take all of their possessions, and the Roman Empire and the officials of that day would do nothing because they were Christians, and you can do whatever you want. So they, when I'm talking about poverty, the word for poverty there is, is abject poverty. It means that they had nothing. Now, I know some of, in some of our minds, our you know, checking account gets down to like 4,000 something. We're like, oh, man, I'm getting tight here, right? No, I'm saying they didn't have anything. And, and Jesus says, I know. I know. I know your tribulations, and I know your poverty. And by the way, then he says, and it's going to get worse. But anyway, we'll get there in just a minute. But look at verse, so that's what was going on. So they had guilds, and it wasn't going well for them. And, it, and then the other thing was, 
Because they also had a large amount of Jews that were in the area, and they didn't, they were, these were not Christ following Jews, these were the old Judaism Jews. And the Jews and the Roman Empire have had a long history together of getting along. There were so many Jewish people back in that day that the Roman Empire pretty much just said, you know what, we're just going to let you do your own thing, and we're not going to, we're not going to bother you. Um, can I prove that point really quickly on something that you'll know? Pilate, Pilate says about Jesus, I find no fault in him. But what did he do? The crowd cries out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says, okay, right? I just want to get along. So they worked together. So you had all these Jews that didn't believe in Jesus, all the Roman Empire that didn't believe in Jesus and thought you should worship the Caesars, and they all teamed up against these believers and followers of Jesus, and they had it really, really bad. But, but look at that verse 9. It says, I know your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. You are rich. They didn't have a stash in their wallet or hidden under the mattress somewhere. God was saying, you know what? You may be poor on this earth, but you are rich in my eyes. How sad it is that so many of us can be in a place where we think we're one thing and, and God thinks we're something else. He writes to one church, and we'll get to it in a, in a week or two. He goes, you think you're alive. But you know what? Your church is dead. How horrible is that? As an individual, for you or for me or as our church, for us to think, man, we've really got it going on here. We're rocking this place. This is awesome. We're doing some great things. And Jesus looks down and says, wow, you're dead. How horrible is that? In, in chapter 3, poor Laodicea, verse 17, they thought, here's what they say, 317 of Revelation, because you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy and I need nothing. This church of Laodicea thought, well, wow, man, we've got it going on. We're rich and we don't really even need the Lord. We can take care of all of our issues and all of our problems. And you know what Jesus says? And you don't know that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. Folks, how do we get to the point as an individual or as a church where we think we're one thing and Jesus says, oh man, I'm looking at you totally different. Here's the, part, here's the thing. He knows us. I, I, I know you, Jesus says. So we can, we can fake each other out, but Jesus knows. So my encouragement to you right now and every time is you can fix this. If this is you, if you know deep down, man, I, my spouse doesn't even know what's going on in my life and nobody knows, but you know what? Jesus does. Jesus knows, but you can fix it even now. You call out to him. Repent and turn, and he'll forgive you. Amen? That's great news. Constantly, I want to give you the good news all the time. Keep it before you. All right, let's go on. Verse 10. Oh, let me just say, I know your slander and those who say they are Jews, and they are not. So these Jews, um, they thought they were all that. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those people, they continued on. They were very proud. They thought that. And you know what Jesus said of them? But they are a synagogue of Satan. Synagogue of Satan. All right, let's go to verse 10. It starts off and he says this several times in Revelation. Don't be afraid. Oh, dear men and women, I just encourage you, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you don't need to be afraid of anything. You don't need to be afraid of what's coming up in Revelation. You don't need to be afraid of what this might happen to our country. Because can I just tell you, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this this morning, and I've made this a special, I've just separated this church by itself, is because I guarantee you, unless something radically happens in this country, we are heading this direction. We are on the path that this stuff is going to happen. We are going to be proud in who we are, and we're looking at the rest of the world, and we are crumbling from within. And believe me, there will be a leader that will raise up and say, you know what? You need to bring it right here. You need to worship me. 
And it will get worse before it gets better. So you better pay attention. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to say you need to decide this morning, am I going to stand or am I going to compromise? Because I'm just telling you the opportunity is coming. <laughs> okay, doesn't it happen all the time with your neighbors or at your work? Uh, we're, we're afraid that somebody's going to criticize us a little bit. Make fun of us a little bit. And we cower down from Christ. <laughs> and you think with the power the government's going to come down on you, you're going to, hey, I'll, no, you better make a decision right today. Because I'm just telling you. I'm begging you to prepare yourself. Jesus says in verse 10, don't be afraid. I know you have tribulations. I know, you're, I know you have poverty. I know you're being slandered. Don't be afraid. And it's going to get worse. But don't be afraid. Here's what he says. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So let me just say a couple things here. There's a couple opportunities here for us to d disagree on some things, and we're okay with that. Because I just want to say, is Jesus Lord? Okay, if we got that, then we can unify together. We're pretty much good. But there are a couple opportunities here for you to disagree with me, and I'm, I'm fine with that. You just need to be fine with it. We'll all worship together. But here's, what, here's why I went through this book, I started this book, and I'm going to go through this book with us keeping our eyes on Jesus and not on a rapture. Here's why. Because our hope is not in the rapture. Amen? Our hope is in Jesus. So all generations up till now have not experienced Christ coming back, and yet their hope was still in Jesus. So they lived, they died, they were persecuted, they might have been put to death. Their hope is in Jesus. They have not seen Christ come back. And, but that's okay. You and I, I know we want to be the generation where Christ comes back, but we might not be. So will you please be prepared? This, <laughs> so Jesus is right off the bat, he says, Listen, I'm going, to, I'm going to roll out in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus is going to reveal to you what's going to happen. And you're going to be persecuted. And I'm going to tell you when I'm going to come back. And then to the very first churches here in that generation, he says, you are going to suffer and you are going to die. And he says that to us as well. If we are following Jesus, we will be persecuted. Remember last week, I'm sending you as sheep, as, as sheep among wolves, I want you to pick up your cross, which is an instrument of torture and um, embarrassment. I want you to carry your cross and follow me, right? It's going to be costly. And so our hope is not in your view of the end times. Our hope is in everybody. Jesus. It is. It's in Jesus. And he's telling these folks right here. See, it didn't work out for them. Things got horrible horrible, horrible, and the Lord didn't come back. You tracking? Just like with the Jews that, in World War II, just like all many generations, right? Persecution and despair, but Christ is on His throne, and that's why we don't need to be afraid. He says, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have tribulation for ten days. So, let's make this clear. And if you agree with me, say amen. Just want to make sure, all right? Get ready. God is in control. Amen. All right. He is. God is sovereign, and he is in control. And yet right here he says the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. You know what God does? Because he loves us and wants to refine us and wants to make us more like himself, he allows us to go through problems. And so we can pray and pray and pray, but God is allowing it to happen. And we should be praying about these things. There are physical issues, issues that are coming upon us. We, we just buried one of our good friends, um, just did the service on Wednesday, right? 54 years old. We prayed and prayed and prayed for him. But you know what? He's, yeah, God healed him. Amen? Woo! God healed him. He's in glory now, I truly believe. 
And so here's the thing. Um, Satan is not in charge of anything on this earth unless God lets him be in charge. But we have examples in Scripture like Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. He, he raised himself up. He got knocked down. Raised himself up. Got knocked down. He was, he was serving the Lord completely and he get knocked down. Serving the Lord, get knocked down. You know what we found out at the end of the story? God had a plan, right? Um, Job is a great example. I don't have time to do Job justice, but the idea is simply this. Satan comes along and says, please let me at that guy, and he'll denounce you. And so God says, okay. And if God would have said, no, keep your hands off, Job wouldn't have suffered any of those troubles. You need to deal with that. Because is God love? Absolutely. And that's why sometimes he'll send things into your life. Because he does love you. And so it proves it out with Job. All right. So let me go to a couple. And if you can keep up with me, that's great. If not, just write these down. First Peter 1. Here's a couple of reasons why I wanted to just share with you about why I think that God allows these things to happen. Because God does allow us to be tested and tried. But we will, but do not be afraid, brothers and sisters, because he's in charge. First Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. Part of the reason is he wants to, to purify us. Listen to this. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. You rejoice in this, for now, for a short time, you have had to be distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which perishes through refine, um, which perishes though refined by fire may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God, one of the reasons He wants to purify us and He wants to receive praise and glory and honor. If we go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says this, And if, and if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with Him, so that we also may be glorified with Him. God wants to make us more like His Son, Jesus. And then Romans 5, 3-5 through 5 says this, And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions, because we know that afflictions produce endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. And this hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, has, who was given to us. So God wants to give us patience and endurance and character and hope. And so do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. God is in control. And so he says, by the way, it's going to get worse. You're going to suffer. You're going to get thrown into prison. And by the way, prison was not um, to rehabilitate them, but it was to death. You, if, you, if you were a traitor, if you would not Say Caesar is Lord, you were a traitor to the Roman Empire, you were cast into prison for the purpose of being put to death. So here's the other opportunity that we can disagree. Ten days. Is that a literal ten days or is that figuratively? And you can decide what you want. It, it doesn't matter to me. I looked up in some commentaries and found at least six different ways they interpreted this ten days. So, I mean, you, you can, whatever you want. Remember in Daniel chapter 2, the very first week, I took you back to Daniel chapter 2, um, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of, and it was very similar to Revelation chapter 1, um, the wording, and, and we laid that all out. But here's a vision, I think it was a gold head, a statute with a gold head and a chest of silver, and then there was bronze and then iron, and then iron mixed with clay with a feet or something like that. And Daniel interpreted the vision and he said, well, it's not really about the statue. It's about what it represents. And it represents um, a mighty, rich kingdom. And then there's going to be another kingdom. And then there's a kingdom of, iron, of bronze or iron. I don't remember which first. And it's going to crush all the other kingdoms. And then there's going to be another um, a, a kingdom of iron that's going to come. And they're going to take over everybody. And then there's going to be a divided kingdom down by the you know, feet. There's, it's going to be mixed with iron and clay. and all, Right? It was symbolic, right? And then Revelation 1.1 says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show Jesus' slaves what must come about. And he says he's going to signify it. That word means as a sign or as a symbols. And so he said, 
This book is about signs and symbols and illustrations. So if you want to say this 10 days is literal, I'm good with that. I think it's figuratively. I think it's figurative. Doesn't matter. We can still, let's worship together to next week. It's okay. Um, it, it, you know, I don't know that every single person that was arrested was held for exactly 10 days and then put to death. Could have been. It's fine. I'm good with that. But there was a common phrase in the Greek language back in this day, and 10 days meant a, a short period of time. So it's kind of like we say, hey, I'll see you later. And that means, you know, I'll, I'll see you soon or whatever. And that means, that, well, they'd say, hey, I'll see you in about 10 days or whatever. It means a week. It means two weeks. It means whatever. But hey, I'll see you shortly. But that's, what, that's the way I choose. But you go online. You look things up. You can you know, pick. I don't know. There's probably a dozen of them. You can figure out what that means. Here's the point. Don't be afraid. You're going to get arrested. The result is going to be death. But Jesus says, I'm in charge. And because I'm in charge, if you remain faithful, look at the end of verse 10, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So there's a couple different words for crown in, in, in uh, Greek. One is, means a crown that a king wears. The other, the other word which is, which is used here is called stephanos, which means it's a crown that they would wear when they got married or to special celebrations. It was a, a crown that worshipers that went to these pagan gods and they'd wear, oh, it's a special occasion, so I'm going to wear a crown. There was a crown building in Smyrna. It was up at the top of Mount Pagos. Athletes got crowns, right? Are you tracking with me? The little wreath things made out of greenery. And if you won an event, boom, you get this put on your head. And, and you know, 10 days later, it's dead, right? And Jesus says, look, so many people that you know of are going after crowns and they tarnish or they die or they fade. If you persevere, if you hang in there, I will give you a crown of life crown of eternal life is what it means. So hang in there. I know it's difficult. I know what you're going through, Jesus says. Hang in there and I will give you a crown of life. Several decades after this, in Smyrna, there was a religious leader of a church in that area named Polycarp. Now, that's a weird name, and that always kind of, kind of, I kind of get hung up on that name, Polycarp. It's kind of weird. I don't, but anyway, just picture him as Paul or Ralph or something like that. But this guy was a religious leader of that day, and he, uh, the persecution started in Smyrna. Persecution started to get worse and worse and worse, and he was born in this area and became a follower of Jesus. Persecution got worse and worse, and some people, some of his followers, talked him into fleeing the city, so he went outside the city and went to a farm. And he hid out at this farm. And he wasn't, it didn't really feel good about that, but he was trying to work through that, and he was praying um, one time, and he, history says that he got a vision that his pillow caught fire. And he took that to mean from the Lord that he was going to burn at the stake for, the, for Jesus. So pretty soon, we found out later that one of his slaves was arrested and, and beaten and tortured until they told him where um, Polycarp was. And so here comes all these, all these Roman guards, all these people come out to arrest this, this rebel, this enemy of the Roman Empire. And they come out and they, they bust into this farm, um, farmhouse and they find Polycarp, an 86-year-old frail man. And they said, well, we're supposed to arrest you. So they, they gently take him and begin to bring him back into Smyrna. And the police officers and those people that were, uh, the guards that were arrest him, they said, why don't you just, here's all you got to do, Polycar, all you got to do is just take a little tiny pinch of incense and burn it on the altar to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord and we'll let you go. And he refused, and he refused, and he refused, and pretty soon they got mad. They kind of beat him up a little bit. They weren't so nice to him anymore. 
and they began to get closer and closer to the city. And inside the city, there was these, this giant coliseum with games going on. And they were putting Christians to death. And so there was a man named, let me get his name. There was a man named Quintus, who was a Christian, and boldly proclaimed to himself and to others that he would stand and be martyred for the name of Jesus. And yet when they brought out the lions and all these animals that were going to devour him, if he didn't recant, he lost hope and he lost faith. And he recanted and he put that little pinch of incense on the altar and said, Caesar is Lord, and he lived. There was another man named Germanicus. And he refused. And the animals devoured him. And it was horrible, horrible death. Ten other followers of Christ were killed at that same time. When the crowd had their fun and they had their sport, they began to put away the animals. And that's about the time that they brought in Polycarp. And the crowd began to, it began to go around about who this guy was and he was leader of the church. So they began to call out. They wanted more. They wanted more. So Polycarp said, when the, when the guards told him, all you have to do is just take this oath. All you got to do is just say it's to Caesar. And he said, um, for, 40, for 86 years, I've served Jesus, and I will ne I never, he never did anything to injure me. How can I now blaspheme my king? And so they said, well, we're going, to throw, we're going to bring out the animals, and they're going to devour you. And he said this, bring them forth. I would change my mind if it meant, not going, uh, if it meant going from worse to better, but not to, to change from right to wrong. Well, they'd already put away the animals, and so they decided not to bring them back out. So what they decided to do is they decided, just as in his vision, they decided to pile up some wood and put a stake in the middle of it, and they said, we're going to burn you to death if you don't offer this incense to Caesar and call him Lord. And he said, it is well. I fear not the fire that burns for a season and after a while is quenched. Why do you delay? Come, do your will. And they burnt him to death. Because he refused to give in. I'm, so here's where we're at. And it's not even bad. It's not even, it's, it's nowhere near Smyrna. It's nowhere near what these believers were facing. But you need to decide. Will you stand in Christ alone? Will you give your allegiance? So many of us would be like that other gentleman, Quintus. I'd rather be like these other men, wouldn't you? That took a stand. So let's fear not. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus.